Hello, everybody. I'm, as you know, Dr. Gay Carlson, president of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry with number 27 of my screen side chats for our ACAP members. My goal with the chats is to share timely clinical practice and other important information from experts on key topics during the COVID-19 pandemic. Reminiscent of President Roosevelt's fireside chats during the Great Depression and World War II, I've wanted the topics to be informative, relevant, and interesting. One of the themes I've been talking with colleagues about is addressing the other pandemic, and that's the crisis in child mental health and access to care. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Sandra DeYoung, Senior Consultant to Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Training at Cambridge Health Alliance in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Secretary of the American Psychiatric Association. She's an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and Sandra has served in a variety of roles in her career, including Division Chief and Training Director. She's also on our ACAP Task Force for uh, the Crisis in Recruitment. Sandra and I work together on the task force, the, the American Psychiatric Association task force on the assessment of psychiatric beds. It was Dr. Jeff Geller's initiative. Uh, he's the recent past president now. And it began last year, chaired by Dr. Anita Everett. Sandra chaired the child and adolescent subgroup that um, I was with her on. And the goal has been to develop a model by which local information about available psychiatric services could be fed into a dynamic model, which would then generate information about the number of psychiatric beds needed. So Sandra, why don't you start out saying, how, how did we get together on this anyway? How, why did we need a separate subcommittee for uh, child and adolescent psychiatry on inpatient treatment? Well, what happened was that the child psychiatrists were spread out in this effort, each focusing on a different topic. And we were all, we learned speaking with one voice, which was sort of raising our hands to our respective groups and saying, actually, it's different in child. And uh, I think- Aren't we always there? <laughs> aren't we always there, right? It's, it's, a, it's a role we often play. And, you know, we found ourselves saying things which, uh, you know, I'm sure ACAP members could sort of view as truisms, things like, you know, children are different in the sense that they're vulnerable, they're a dependent population. There's a higher bar for safety. We have to include their families, right? Which means that you have to have places that are near where families live. That you have to speak the, the caretaker's language or have interpreter services. Development, 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 right? Is more important than generally than for adults. Uh, social factors may be paramount. And oftentimes mental illness itself isn't sort of fully declared. The adult folks think a lot in terms of diagnoses, and of course we do too, but a child may not present carrying a sign, you know, I am this. So we, these things are unfolding. And so those all make the, the kids we treat, I think different from the adults that um, we may treat. But also I think what we know is that our system of care is, is different. So I think many of us would say that child mental health was already has been in crisis for some time in terms of services that um, for decades, we've seen an increase in demand for child mental health services, partly because we have better ways to treat these kids, um, but partly sadly because um, mental health issues have been increasing in kids. And yet at that same time, beds have been decreasing we very much, you know, I think, think of child mental health inpatient as just one element of a continuum of care in communities. But of course, we know that those uh, continua of care are often not very continuous, uh, particularly in communities with racial and ethnic minorities where underserved uh, areas, um, rural populations are underserved. And we all know there's a shortage of child psychiatrists, so that also has made the, the providing services in this continuum uh, more challenging. And then I think there are some things that are just interesting realities of providing uh, inpatient treatment for kids, which uh, are things like, um, you know, in smaller systems particularly, uh, demand tends to be seasonal. So you may not be able to get a child bed in November, but um, August is easy. Um, so those kinds of you know staffing issues, number of beds available become more complicated. 
And then financing is different. So, um, you know, we rely obviously on public and private insurance, but particularly for residential care, school systems may be contributing or state agencies. And then finally, I would just say that it's an interesting question, sort of how do we define the population of kids who need inpatient care? Uh, in the adult population, they um, tend to use the SAMHSA term serious mental illness. Um, and we in child talk about uh, severe emotional disturbance, but they're not really equivalent terms in many ways. SED comes out of the special education literature and it's just hard to find a way to sort of easily capture, I think, the population that we're talking about. So really for all of those reasons, we thought it was gonna be important to have certainly um, you know, a separate focus on child and even ultimately a, a separate model for child. And we'll talk about that, I think. So, so I always say child psychiatry, that, that there used to be a quote about um, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did only backwards and in heels. Yeah. And I like to say that that's the same thing that's true for child psychiatry. We do yeah. everything that adult psychiatrists do, but backwards and in heels. So, um, yeah, so I think that was, and it was kind of a spontaneous, each of us, <laughs> so it was um, Sandra, Dr. DeYoung, uh, Christopher Balanci, and myself that, that were the core people in the beginning and each in our own subgroups. I, you know, felt like we were the odd man out and embraced each other and said, we, we really need to form our own task force. So the final product is going to be a white paper and a simulation model. Before we sort of talk more about inpatient care and, and what goes into it, um, why don't you close the loop for us, Sandra, and tell us uh, what happens with the model and, and what um, listeners might be able to read maybe, maybe in a year from now. Yeah, so this is really, I think, uh, an idea that comes from engineering and and you know other um, areas of thinking, but it's I think a, a really useful idea for us. So modeling is a is a dynamic simulated model that we were creating, and what it allows you to do is enter a certain set of data. Uh, and then uh, vary it, uh, see what the model does when you vary the data. And it allows you to create uh, what if scenarios, right? So what if we did this, uh, what would happen? And that's just helpful because that allows you to figure out what would happen without actually having to make changes in the real world. Um, so you can hold a certain factor stable, uh, you know, in a model um, stable and change other things. So for example, you know, you might ask uh, if we had 20 more beds in our acute community treatment setting in my catchment area or county, how would that affect the number of inpatient beds that in the hospitals that we needed? So uh, that's, I think, a potentially very useful exercise for decision makers. And the idea or hope is that models can be used by catchment areas, counties, states, regions, hospital systems to understand their current system um, and then uh, think about uh, how to change it most effectively. So they can look at things like, you know, uh, the age distribution within their catchment area or the prevalence of developmental disorders and use those uh, questions to sort of tweak the model and see what happens with those kinds of parameters changed. So hopefully it'll be a useful tool really for guiding decision-making. So that brings us to something that we spent a fair amount of time on, and that is, what does a child inpatient, what is a child inpatient bed supposed to do? It's not like there's this one unitary view that said, okay, well, this is what it's supposed to do, because it seems to me, depending on what it is you want it to do, you have different pieces that go into your intake system and out of your outflow system. So. So what are some of your thoughts or, or what, what were some of the things that we came up with that we thought about inpatient beds? Yeah, and you're right. We did have long discussions about this. It sounds like a simple question, but it's it's a complex answer. I think it, at the most basic, um, child inpatient provides a secure setting with highly skilled uh, mental health professionals when a child's mental health condition or their behaviors make it impossible for them to stay at home with only say outpatient care or sometimes when that home environment just can't need, meet the the kids needs anymore and we we looked at a bunch of literature on this and i and um 
I think four broad categories sort of emerged from the literature. One was, um, you know, uh, inpatient meets uh, the needs at times for kids with mental illness who may or may not have co-occurring medical problems. Um, kids with developmental disorders who may or may not have comorbid mental health problems. Um, uh, kids with you know acute psychosocial situations who, who may or may not have a defined mental illness but who are not safe uh, being at home and then a whole uh, other categories forensic beds which we really didn't think about so much in our group as which was consistent with the rest of the the group you know i think our one of the things that we felt very strongly about in our conversations was that um, child and patient beds should not just be available in crisis that yes that's an important function that they serve but that with kids we often need inpatient as a safe place to do in-depth evaluations uh, and and uh, do um, put into place and you know treatment plans that couldn't happen if the child was at home. And it's often in the setting of the outpatient providers or those at lower levels of care feeling that they need help. You know, they've been trying things and it's not been working, or perhaps there's been a decision for a major medication change. Uh, you know, and in those kinds of settings, particularly to protect the safety of kids and to be able to monitor them 24 seven and see the impact of what we do, uh, along with their caretakers and families, um, that inpatient settings seem to us to provide a really, really important uh, option for that. So we would we assert in our chapter that that we think that should be an important purpose for yeah. inpatient services. So that and that, and that's something that I don't think I, I think we've dumbed it down at this point, and, and I don't mean this in any insulting way, but we dumbed it down at this point so that inpatient units are basically extended emergency rooms that the idea is you get the person in you are desperately looking for outpatient treatment and um you uh, append this um euphemism called stabilization on it and so if the child comes in because he or she uh is feeling suicidal or is a very is very aggressive those are the two most common ones but whatever um, you know, if they're okay for 24 hours, your idea is to boot them out as quickly as you can because the real estate is so expensive. And so you've got insurance companies barking, uh, uh, you know, in your left ear and your hospital administration barking in your right ear. And oh my God, the kid's been here for three days and you haven't changed his medication. So um, we have a number of things that are working against what it is you really want some kind of protected setting to do and then of course the question is is where should that setting be does it need to be in a hospital with all of the various um just i don't know um and again i don't i don't mean bureaucratic and necessarily a um and a defamatory way but there are certain things that hospitals have to be able to do that maybe other places don't have to do so it, th there's a variety of of um pressures that are not allowing us to be able to use a confined place out of the child's home to figure out what it is he needs. So de facto, kid doesn't stay long and he's out. Yeah. The other pressure, I guess, and this, is, this has been a particularly relevant one now, is there are many kids banging down the... And, many emergency rooms and um, crisis beds in pediatric hospitals banging down the doors saying, we need a bed, we need a bed, we need a bed. And so having somebody, you know, in the hospital for three or four weeks coming off some complicated medical regimen so that you can find something else, it's like, well, sorry, you know, we've got, you know, five uh, acute appendicitis out here. We can't worry about your... Mm -hmm you know, heart transplant. So um, what do we do with that? Yeah, you know, I think it's been, uh, we're certainly in a crisis now with uh, boarding and uh, wait lists and so forth. And, um, the, you know, I think it's, it's certainly uh, recently been due to COVID, but I, I really want to emphasize that I, I think it's been a perfect storm uh, that we've had a system that um, is at best incomplete and insufficient and uh, 
that has been, you know, uh, under increasing pressure in recent decades. Um, and then we had this just surge in demand for child mental health services uh, in the setting of COVID, which has included, you know, not only a significant uh, rise in the rates of mental health diagnoses in kids, but just a, a terrible loss of the um, support systems and coping structures that families and kids usually have in place. Uh, most notably school, right, where about a, a third of kids get some kind of mental health care anyway. Um, but with school closures and, you know, families under stress and all the rest of it, it's just been a terrible, terrible time. And so we have a clamoring for inpatient beds. And I know my own system is in the process of developing a whole bunch more inpatient beds at the request of the Massachusetts DMH. Um, and that's what happens in crisis, right? Is that there are people think that the solution to a child in crisis is a, a bed and sometimes it is. I have to wonder though, you know, what would have happened if we had a more robust uh, continuum of care nationally um, and with the advent of telepsychiatry, um, would there have been a way to provide care for these kids outside of hospital beds? And I think, you know, we don't know that, um, but I think that uh, as we look at this issue moving forward, I think one of the things we'll have to anticipate is how does our child mental health system cope when there is a sudden surge in demand like this? Because, uh, I, I mean, I, I wish one could say there will never be a pande pandemic or a, a national public health crisis again, but I think what we're learning is that they happen and we need to be prepared for them. Design for me what you'd like. I mean, if, if we were to say, okay, you know, Dr. DeYoung, you, here's a million bucks or whatever it is it ne it's needed, what would you do with it? Hmm. First of all, I doubt a million bucks is going to do it, Gabe. No, I know, I know. <laughs> Metaphorically. <laughs> so, you know, I think we need a much more systematic approach to child mental health. I really think child mental health is a, is a population public health issue. I mean, there will always be a need for kids to have individual treatment and excellent psychotherapy. But... But I think our, our sort of conceptual framework needs to be much more of a public health approach. And um, so for one thing, I think we need to be consistent in the terminology that we're using for specific services, because uh, right now it's a nightmare. You know, each state uses something different. And we need to collect data much more consistently than we do. So we need to understand better, I think, on a national and state level uh, what's happening. And then I think we need to develop systems of continuous care. And, you know, there are places that are doing this well. So for my money, I would look at the New Jersey system. They underwent a major innovation 20 years ago in their child mental health system of care. And they've learned a lot from that and, I, and have uh, very impressive outcomes. And I, you know, it may not work in every state. Clearly, um, there are different, um, you know, as we've just been talking about with the model, each catchment area or system has its unique features. But I think we need to learn from what's working and apply it to really fill the holes in the continuums of care across the country. We also, you know, we, we need to not just evaluate on a systemic level what's working, but I think we also need to evaluate much more uh, as child psychiatry researchers and healthcare delivery researchers sort of um, what works. So what is it that about inpatient care, for example, uh, that is different, that provides something unique that, say, a community-based acute um, you know, unit that's less highly staffed, for example, and maybe unlocked. What's the difference in, in those kinds of two systems in terms of what they do for the child and the family? And, and we don't have great data about that. We need to know more about length of stay, you know, so maybe we have been um, settling for two short lengths of stay and we, we need to be able to say uh, if length of stay is related in fact to quality outcomes. Um, so I would, I would want a really continuous system of care where we are regularly collecting data both at a system level and at a unit level and at a, an individual level and, and assessing it. Um, and uh, it really needs to be inclusive. It can't be, um, you know, 
better in some geographic areas than others. Families shouldn't have to drive like they do now in places like Texas for hundreds of miles to get care. Um, and it needs to really meet the, the sort of the cultural um, aspects and linguistic aspects of the, the families and children. So, um, so, you know, I think those are things that are all, well, they're certainly near and dear to my heart. I was talking, my, you know, my presidential initiative is, is on emotionally dysregulated kids who are often the ones that end up on inpatient units. And so I was talking to my task force about it. And we were talking about the fact that there really are no good measures that you can look at to justify inpatient care. How do you, how do you say, well, gays unit is, is really the, a paragon of virtue. And so let's emulate that. Gay can't show that, you know, her unit is a paragon of virtue because she doesn't have a way to be able to say, well, this is how the kid came in. This is how the kid left. This is what happens to him downstream. Pe people look at readmission rates, but I, I always say readmission rates is like saying, well, fine, I'll feed you and bathe you and you'll look pretty good, you know, tomorrow. And then you go back to whatever circumstances you're in and I see you in a month and you're dirty and hungry and disheveled. That's not my fault. You right. know, that, that's, that may be my fault because I couldn't find a good place for you to be, but I can't do everything. So, so readmission rates is not it. And, you know, in a five day length of stay, frankly, you can't do very much. You can't even really make a decent diagnosis half the time. So, you know, yes, we need outcome measures, but I'm not sure what those outcome measures should be. Many years ago, when I came to Stony Brook, I set up our inpatient unit and I had the nurses as part of their job. And we developed this from scratch once a week because the length of stay was now we're talking one to two months and mm -hmm. sometimes longer. The nurses would every Friday, we would do weekly ratings on an inpatient global rating scale and we fed it into the computer. And so on Tuesday, when we had our big rounds and we talked about what we were gonna do with the kids, we had data that we could look at to say, oh, you know, it looks like such and thus work. Because if you ask the staff and the kid had just had a blowout, oh, that's not working. And, and then you look at the data and the data say, well, you know, he had, five outbursts last week and he only had three this week, maybe that's a trick. But you need to have a system in place that, and someone has to pay for it. And yeah. guess who said, oh, we're not going to let you do that. That takes too much time. And we're not going to let you have the number of staff you need to do that. It's too expensive. So, so there's the problem that sometimes we know what to do, but we don't have the um, support that basically says, this is really important and this is what we have to do. So th there's a number of things I think you're right about the perfect storm where, you know, it has been inpatient care has been dumbed down to the point where I personally don't think it accomplishes very much of anything other than being a large triage operation that, you know, is able to do a little more than an emergency room, but frankly, not that much more. Yeah, and I think the, um, uh, uh, to your point earlier, I, I think however good the work that is done in an inpatient setting, it can be rapidly undone if the uh, continuum of care and what happens for the child in the community uh, isn't holding for that kid. So I think it's really, you know, by the time we see kids on an inpatient unit, unfortunately, um, there have often been many uh, missed opportunities along the way for prevention and early intervention. And so I actually think one possible system metric is a reduced demand for child inpatient beds. You know, I think if the overall system were really doing a great job, I'm not sure we would need more beds. Um, mm -hmm. But that really takes everything from school-based systems, you know, community cohesion, you know, all of the folks, the community psychiatry folks talk about, I think is incredibly important, particularly perhaps for kids. It seems to me also we have a situation where um, we used to have, again, this is back in the dark ages of, of maybe 10 years or so ago, we used to have the kids in the hospital, they would do well, they'd earn their points, et cetera, et cetera. They would get to the point where they were able to have a pass with their parents all day. And, or we could even send them home overnight. 
so we could see if the parent could handle the kid or get the kid on the school bus in the morning or whatever. There was a step down way of being able to manage the child so that you could increasingly, it's sort of like a step down cardiac unit. Mm -hmm. So you could see him function. We couldn't do that because insurance said, well, shoot, if he's well enough to do that, we're not paying for an inpatient bed. So, you know, we've got a we've got a payer problem as well as a system problem. We know what to do, but we're not getting finance to do it. And so um, I, you know, this is where the healthcare and economics committees and so forth come in and, and advocacy comes in in terms of being able to um to to get to the people who hold the purse strings here. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh you know, I think, uh, in particularly when we're dealing with small systems, it's hard to advocate effectively to the payers, right? So I think one of the advantages of really thinking in a bigger system level is that we will have stronger advocacy for, for payment issues. I think the, the one final thing we were talking about, the importance of research, um, even if you were to demonstrate that your unit at Cambridge Hospital did this wonderful job, it will be one unit and or you know one place. And so people will say, well, you know, I'm not sure we could publish that. That's just that's just one place. You know, we we need to have we need to have a number of places demonstrating it, sort of like a multi-site trial. I think that's going to be a fairly significant lift as well. I do too. Um, you know, I, I think we can learn though from international systems um, where they have things like universal health care that make it somewhat easier to study the impact of specific interventions. So for example, in Germany, they've been experimenting with uh, providing care in families' homes um, and you know, going to the patient instead of bringing the patient in. Um, and I think these are the kinds of things that we, we really need to learn from. In the UK, their, um, public, their um, public mental health system for kids has very delineated tiers across the country. Um, and so I think we need to look broadly around the, the world to, to, um, to see what might be working elsewhere as well. I don't think we can do all the research on our own, although I certainly think we need to do much more of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good note to, I, I think the idea of, of uh, pooling our data internationally really is, is a, we can learn from each other. So let, let's, let's end on that note. And uh, let me thank you for, first of all, I've really enjoyed working with you on this committee and getting to know you. And it's been an, ex an extremely interesting committee to work on, but I think we did something really important. So I thank you for your leadership on that. Thank you and thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for listening to us. Take care. Thank you all very much for tuning in. This is Gay Carlson for ACAP's Screenside Chats. ACAP provides Screenside Chats as a member in public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of ACAP policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by ACAP. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their participation in Screenside Chats does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACAP or any of its officials.